the city of Maradon burned. Violent, twisting columns of smoke rose from dozens of buildings. The careful city planning kept the fires from spreading too quickly, but did not stop them entirely. Human beings and tinder, they went together. Iteralda crouched inside a broken building, rubble to his left, a small band of Saldaeans to his right. He'd abandoned the palace early on. It had been swarmed with shadow spawn. He'd left it packed with all the oil they'd been able to find, then had the Ashaman set it aflame, killing hundreds of Trollocs and Fades trapped inside. He glanced out the window of his current hiding place. He could have sworn he'd seen a patch of bare sky out the window, but the ash and smoky haze in the air made it difficult to tell. A building nearby burned so intensely that he could feel the heat through the stone. He used the smoke and the fire. Almost everything on a battlefield could be an advantage. In this case, once Yurli had accepted that the city was lost, they'd stopped defending it. Now they used the city as a killing ground. The streets created a maze that Iteralda, with the help of the Saldaeans, knew and his enemies did not. Every rooftop was a ridge to give high ground, every alley a secret escape route, every open square a potential trap. The Trollocs and their commanders had made a mistake. They assumed that Iteralda cared about protecting the city. They mistook him. All he cared about now was doing as much damage to them as possible. So he used their assumptions against them. Yes, their army was large, but any man who had ever tried to kill rats knew that the size of his hammer didn't matter, so long as the rats knew how to hide. A hesitant group of the creatures shuffled down the blackened street outside Iteralda's building. The Trollocs snapped and hooted warily at one another. Some sniffed at the air, but the smoke ruined their sense of smell. They completely missed Iteralda and his small band, just inside the building. Hoofbeats rang on the other end of the street. The Trollocs began to shout, and a group hurried to the front, setting wickedly barbed spears down with the butts against the cobbles. Charging that would be death for cavalry. The Trollocs were learning to be more careful. But they weren't learning well enough. The cavalry came into view, revealing one man leading a group of wounded and exhausted horses. A distraction. Now, Iteralda said. The archers around him sprang up and began shooting out the windows at the Trollocs. Many died. Others spun and charged. And from a side street, a cavalry charge. The horses' hooves covered with rags to dampen sound galloped out, their approach covered by the louder hooves of the diversionary horses. The Saldaeans ripped through the Trollocs, trampling and killing. The archers whooped and took out swords and axes to finish off the wounded Trollocs. No fade was with this group, bless the light. Iteralda stood up, a wet handkerchief to his face against the smoke. His weariness, once buried deep, was slowly resurfacing. He was worried that when it hit him, he'd drop unconscious. Bad for morale, that. No, he thought. Hiding in the smoke while your home burns, knowing that the Trollocs are slowly penning you in? That's bad for morale. His men finished off the fist of Trollocs, then hastened to another predecided building that they could hide in. Iteralda had about 30 archers and a company of cavalry, which he moved among five independent bands of irregular fighters similar to this one. He waved his men back into hiding while his scouts brought him information. Even with the scouts, it was difficult to get a good read on the large city. He had vague ideas of where the strongest resistance was, and sent what orders he could. But the battle was spread over too large an area for him to be able to coordinate the fighting effectively. He hoped Yurli was well. The Ashaman were gone, escaping at his order through the tiny gateway, only large enough to crawl through, that Antail had made. Since they'd gone, it was hours ago now, there had been no sign of whatever rescuers were supposedly coming. Before the Ashaman left, he'd sent a scout through a gateway to that ridge where the last riders had been said to watch. All that the scout found was an empty camp, the fire burning unattended. 
I, Teralta, joined his men inside the new hiding place, leaving his handkerchief, now stained with soot, on the doorknob to give the scouts a clue to his location. Once inside, he froze, hearing something outside. Hush, he said to the men. They stilled their clinking armor. Footfalls. Many of them. That was a trollic band for certain. His men had orders to move silently. He nodded to his soldiers, holding up six fingers. Plan number six. They'd hide, waiting, hoping the creatures would pass them by. If they didn't, if they delayed or started searching the nearby buildings, his team would burst out and broadside them. It was the riskiest of the plans. His men were exhausted, and the cavalry had been sent to another of his group of defenders. But better to attack than be discovered or surrounded. Hyteralda sidled up to the window, waiting, listening, breathing shallowly. Light, but he was tired. The group marched around the corner outside, footfalls in unison. That was odd. Trollocs didn't march so regularly. My lord, one of his men whispered. There aren't any hooves. Hyteralda froze. The man was right. His tiredness was making him stupid. That's an army of hundreds, he thought. He got to his feet, coughing despite himself, and pushed open the door. He stepped outside. A gust of wind blew down the street as Iteralda's men piled out behind him. The wind cleared the smoke for a moment, revealing a large troop of infantry kitted out in silvery armor and carrying pikes. They seemed ghosts for a moment, glowing in a phantom golden light from above, a son he had not seen in months. The newcomers began to call as they saw him and his men, and two of their officers charged up to him. They were Saldaean. Where is your commander? One asked. The man rode a Iteralda. Aye. Iteralda found himself coughing. I am he. Who are you? Bless the light, one of the men said, turning back to the others. Pass the word to Lord Bashir. We've found him. Iteralda blinked. He looked back at his filthy men, faces blackened with soot. More than a few had an arm in a sling. He'd started with two hundred. Now there were fifty. They should be celebrating, but most of them sat down on the ground, closing their eyes. Iteralda found himself laughing. Now? The dragon sends help. Now? He stumbled, then sat down, staring up at the burning sky. He was laughing, and he could not stop. Soon tears began streaking down his cheeks. Yes, there was sunlight up there. Iteralda had regained some composure by the time the troops led him into a well-defended sector of the city. The smoke here was much less thick. Supposedly, Althor's troops, led by Davram Bashir, had reclaimed most of Maradon. What was left of it? They'd been putting out the fires. It was so odd to see troops with shiny armor, neat uniforms, clean faces. They'd swept in with large numbers of Ashaman and Aes Sedai, and an army that, for now, had been enough to drive the Shadow Spawn back to the hillside fortifications above the river. Althor's men led him to a tall building inside the city. With the palace burned out, mostly destroyed, it looked like they'd picked this building as a command center. Iteralda had been fighting a draining war for weeks now. Althor's troops seemed almost too clean. His men had been dying while these men washed and slept and dined on hot food. Stop it, he told himself, entering the building. It was far too easy to blame others when a battle went wrong. It wasn't the fault of these men that their lives had been easier than his recently. He labored up the stairs, wishing they'd let him be. A good night's sleep, a wash, and then he could meet with Bashir. But no, that wouldn't do. The battle wasn't over, and Althor's men would need information. It was just that his mind was failing him, working very slowly. He reached the top floor and followed Bashir's soldiers into a room to the right. 
Bashir stood there, wearing a burnished breastplate without the matching helmet, hands clasped behind his back as he looked out the window. He wore one of those overly large Saldean mustaches and a pair of olive trousers stuffed into knee-high boots. Bashir turned and started. Light, you look like death itself, man. He turned to the soldiers. He should be in the healer's tent. Someone fetch an Ashaman. I'm all right, Iteralda said, forcing sternness into his voice. I look worse than I feel, I'd warrant. The soldiers hesitated, looking to Bashir. Well, the man said, at least get him a chair and something to wipe his face with. You poor fellow. We should have been here days ago. Outside, Iteralta could hear the sounds of distant battle. Bashir had chosen a tall building, one from which he could survey the fighting. The soldiers brought a chair, and, for all his wish to show a strong face to a fellow general, Iteralta sat with a sigh. He looked down and was amazed to see how dirty his hands were, as though he'd been cleaning a hearth. No doubt his face was soot-covered, streaked with sweat, and there was likely still dried blood on it. His clothing was ragged from the blast that had destroyed the wall, not to mention a hastily bandaged cut on his arm. Your defense of this city was nothing short of stunning, Lord Iteralda, Bashir said. There was a formality to his tone. Saldea and Aradaman were not enemies, but two strong nations could not share a border without periods of animosity. The number of Trollocs dead compared to the number of men you had? And with a gap that large in the wall? Let me say that I'm impressed. Bashir's tone implied that such praise was not easily given. What of Yuri? Iteralda asked. Bashir's expression grew grim. My men found a small band defending his corpse. He died bravely, though I was surprised to find him in command, and Torquemon, a distant cousin of mine, the presumed leader of the city, locked in his rooms and abandoned where the Trollocs could have gotten him. Yurley was a good man, Iteralda said stiffly. Among the bravest I've had the honor of knowing. He saved my life, brought my men into the city against Torquemon's orders. It's a burning shame to lose him. A burning shame. Without Yurley, Maradon wouldn't stand right now. It hardly stands anyway, Bashir said somberly. Iteralda hesitated. He's uncle to the queen. This city is probably his home. The two looked at one another, like old wolves, leaders of rival packs, stepping softly. I'm sorry for your loss, Iteralda said. The city stands as well as it does, Bashir said, because of you. I'm not angry, man. I'm saddened, but not angry. And I'll take your word on Yurley. To be frank, I never liked Torquemon. For now, I've left him in the room where we found him, still alive, thankfully. Though I'll hear thunder from the Queen for what's been done to him. She's always been fond of him. Bah. She normally has better judgment. Bashir nodded to the side when he spoke of Torquemon, and, with a start, Iteralda realized that he recognized this building. This was Torquemon's home, where Yurli had brought Iteralda on his first day in the city. It made sense to choose this building as a command post. It was close enough to the northern wall to have a good view of the outside, but far enough away from the blast to have survived, unlike the council hall. Well, it would have served Torquemon right if the Trollocs had gotten him. Iteralda sat back, closing his eyes as Bashir consulted with his officers. Bashir was capable, that much was obvious. Very quickly, he'd swept the city clean. Once the Trollocs had realized that there was a larger force to fight, they'd abandoned the city. Iteralda could feel pride that, in part, his tenacity was what had made them so quick to run. Iteralda continued to listen. Most of Bashir's troops had come into the city through gateways, after sending in one scout to find safe places to make them. Fighting in the streets wouldn't work for him as it had Iteralda. The hit-and-hide tactic 
had been devoted to doing as much damage as possible before getting killed. It was a losing tactic. The Trollocs had pulled back into the fortifications, but they wouldn't stay there for long. As he sat with closed eyes, struggling to stay awake, Iteralda heard Bashir and his captains come to the same dire conclusion Iteralda had. Maradon was lost. The Shadow Spawn would wait for night, then swarm in again. After all this, they'd just flee. After Yurli had died holding the city. After Rajabi had been killed by a Drakkar. After Ancare and Rossin had fallen during the skirmishes inside the walls. After all the bloodshed, they finally saw help arrive, only to have it prove insufficient. Perhaps we could push them off that hilltop, one of Bashir's men said. Clean out the fortifications. He didn't sound very optimistic. Son, Iteralda said, forcing his eyes open. I held that hill for weeks against a superior force. Your people built it up well, and the problem with well-built fortifications is that your enemy can turn them against you. You'll lose men attacking there, a lot of them. The room fell silent. We leave then, Bashir said. Naif, we'll need gateways. Yes, Lord Bashir. Square-faced and lean of build, the man wore the black coat and the dragon pin of an Ashaman. Malayne, gather the cavalry and organize them outside. Make it look as if we're going to try an assault against their fortifications. That'll keep them eager and waiting. We'll evacuate the wounded, then we'll have the cavalry charge in the other direction into... By the light and my hope for rebirth, a voice suddenly exclaimed. Everyone in the room turned in shock. That wasn't the sort of oath you heard every day. A young soldier stood by the window, looking out with a looking glass. Bashir cursed and hurried to the window, the others crowding around, several taking out looking glasses. What now? Iteralda thought, standing despite his fatigue and hurrying over. What could they possibly have come up with? More Drakkar? Dark hounds? He peered out the window, and someone handed him a looking glass. He raised it, and as he'd guessed, the building was on enough of a rise to look out over the city wall and onto the killing field outside and the beyond. The tower positions on the crest of the hill were clustered with ravens. Through the glass, he could see Trollocs clogging the heights, holding the upper camp, the towers, and the bulwarks there. Beyond the hill, surging down through the pass, was an awesome force of Trollocs, many times the number that had assaulted Maradon. The wave of monsters seemed to continue on forever. We need to go, Bashir said, lowering his looking glass. Immediately. Light, Iteralda whispered. If that force gets past us, there won't be anything in Saldea and or Aradaman that can stop it. Please tell me the Lord Dragon made peace with the Shan Chan as he promised. In that, a quiet voice said from behind, as in so many other things, I have failed. Iteralda spun, lowering his looking glass. A tall man with red-gold hair stepped into the room, a man whom Iteralda felt he had never met before despite the familiar features. Randolph Thor had changed. The Dragon Reborn had that same self-confidence, that same straight back, that same attitude expecting obedience. And yet at the same time, everything seemed different. The way he stood, no longer faintly suspicious, the way he studied Iteralda with concern. Those eyes, cold and emotionless, had once convinced Iteralda to follow this man. Those eyes had changed too. Iteralda had not noted wisdom in them before. Don't be a thick-headed fool, Iteralda thought. You can't tell if a man is wise by looking at his eyes. And yet he could. Rodel Aitaralda, Althor said, stepping forward and laying a hand on Aitaralda's arm. I left you and your men stranded and overwhelmed. Please forgive me. I made this choice myself, Aitaralda said. 
Oddly, he felt less tired than he had just moments ago. I have inspected your men, Althor said. There are so few left, and they are broken and battered. How did you hold this city? What you have done is a miracle. I do what needs to be done. You must have lost many friends. I... Yes. What other answer was there? To dismiss it as nothing would be to dishonor them. Wakeda fell today. Rajabi... Well, a Drakkar got him. Ancare... He lasted until this afternoon. Never did find out why that trumpeter sounded early. Rawson was looking into it. He's dead, too. We need to get out of the city, Bashir said, his voice urgent. I'm sorry, man. Maradon is lost. No, Althor said softly. The Shadow will not have this city. Not after what these men did to hold it. I will not allow it. An honorable sentiment, Bashir said. But we don't... He trailed off as Elthor looked at him. Those eyes. So intense. They seemed almost a light. They will not take this city, Bashir, Althor said, an edge of anger entering his quiet voice. He waved to the side and a gateway split the air. The sounds of drums and Trollocs yelling grew closer suddenly. I'm tired of letting him hurt my people. Pull your soldiers back. With that, Althor stepped through the gateway. A pair of Aiel maidens hurried into the room, and he left the gateway open long enough for them to leap through behind him. Then he let it vanish. Bashir looked stunned, mouth half open. Curse that man, he finally said, turning to the window again. I thought he wasn't going to do this sort of thing any longer. Aitoralda joined Bashir, raising his looking glass, looking out through the enormous gap in the wall. Outside, Althor was crossing the trampled ground, wearing his brown cloak and followed by the two maidens. Aitoralda thought he could hear the sounds of howling Trollocs. Their drums beat. They saw three people alone. The Trollocs surged forward, charging across the ground. Hundreds. Thousands. Aitoralda gasped. Bashir uttered a quiet prayer. Althor raised one hand, then thrust it, palm forward, toward the tide of Shadowspawn. And they started to die. It began with waves of fire, much like the ones Ashaman used. Only these were far larger. The flames burned terrible swaths of death through the Trollocs. They followed the course of the land, seeping up the hill and down into the trenches, filling them with white-hot fire, searing and destroying. Clouds of Drakkar spun in the sky, diving for Althor. The air above him turned blue, and shards of ice exploded outward, spraying the air like arrows from the bows of an entire banner of archers. The beasts shrieked there in human agony, carcasses tumbling to the ground. Light and power exploded from the Dragon Reborn. He was like an entire army of channelers. Thousands of shadow spawn died. Death gates sprang up, striking across the ground, killing hundreds. The Ashaman Naif, standing beside Bashir, gasped. I've never seen so many waves at once, he whispered. I can't track them all. He's a storm. A storm of light and streams of power. Clouds began to form and swirl above the city. The wind picked up, howling and lightning struck from above. Blasts of thunder overpowered the sounds of drums as Trollocs tried in vain to get to Althor, climbing over the burning carcasses of their brethren. The swirling white clouds crashed into the black, boiling tempest, intermingling. Wind spun around Althor, whipping at his cloak. The man himself seemed to be glowing. Was it the reflection of the swaths of fire, or perhaps the lightning blasts? Althor seemed brighter than them all, his hand upraised against the shadow spawn. His maidens hunched near the ground on either side of him, eyes forward, shoulders set against the great wind. Clouds, 
spinning about one another made funnels into the masses of trollocs, sweeping across the top of the hill, taking up the creatures into the air. Great water spouts rose behind, made of flesh and fire. The beasts rained down, falling upon the others. My Tyralda watched with awe, the hair on his arms and head rising. There was an energy to the very air itself. A scream came from nearby, within the building, in one of the nearby rooms. My Tyralda did not turn away from the window. He had to watch this beautiful, terrible moment of destruction and power. Waves of Trollocs broke, the drums faltering. Entire legions of them turned and fled, stumbling up the hillside and over one another, fleeing back toward the Blight. Some remained firm, too angry, too intimidated by those driving them, or too stupid to flee. The tempest of destruction seemed to come to a peak, flashes of light blasting down in time with howling wind, drumming waves of burning flame, tinkling shards of ice. It was a masterwork. A terrible, destructive, wonderful masterwork. Althor lifted his hand toward the sky. The winds grew faster, the lightning strikes larger, the fire is hotter. Trollocs screamed, moaned, howled. Aitaralda found himself trembling. Althor closed his hand into a fist, and it all ended. The last of the wind-seized Trollocs dropped from the sky like leaves abandoned by a passing breeze. Everything fell silent. The flames died, the black and white clouds cleared, and opened to a blue sky. Althor lowered his hand. The field before him was piled with carcasses atop carcasses. Tens of thousands of dead Trollocs smoldering. Directly before Althor, a pile a hundred paces wide formed a ridge five feet tall, a mound of dead that had nearly reached him. How long had it taken? Aitaralda found that he could not gauge the time, though looking at the sun, at least an hour had passed, perhaps more. It had seemed like seconds. Althor turned to walk away. The maidens rose on shaky feet, stumbling after him. What was that scream? Nath asked. The one nearby, in the building. Did you hear it? My Geralda frowned. What had that been? He crossed the room, the others, including several of Bashir's officers, following. Many others stayed in the room, however, staring out at the field that had been cleansed by ice and by fire. It was odd, but Aitaralda hadn't been able to spot a single fallen tower atop the hill. It was as if Althor's attacks had somehow affected only the shadow spawn. Could a man really be that precise? The hallway outside was empty, but Aitaralda had a suspicion now of where the scream had come from. He walked to Lord Torquemon's door. Bashir unlocked it, and they went inside. It seemed empty. Aitaralda felt a spike of fear. Had the man escaped? He pulled out his sword. No. A figure was huddled in the corner beside the bed, fine clothing wrinkled, doublet stained with blood. Aitaralda lowered his sword. Lord Torquemon's eyes were gone. He appeared to have put them out with a writing quill. The bloodied implement lay on the ground beside him. The window was broken. Bashir glanced out it. Lady Torquemon is down there. She jumped, Torquemon whispered, clawing at his eye sockets, fingers covered with blood. He sounded dazed. That light, that terrible light. Aitaralda glanced at Bashir. I cannot watch it, Torquemon muttered. I cannot. Great Lord, where is your protection? Where are your armies to rend, your swords to strike? That light eats at my mind, like rats feasting on a corpse. It burns at my thoughts. It killed me. That light killed me. He's gone mad, Bashir said grimly, kneeling down beside the man. Better than he deserved, judging by those ramblings. Light, 
my own cousin, a dark friend, and in control of the city. What is he talking about? One of Bashir's men said. A light? Surely he couldn't have seen the battle. None of these windows face the right way. I'm not sure he was talking about the battle, Bogler, Bashir said. Come on. I suspect the Lord Dragon is going to be tired. I want to see that he's cared for. <laughs>